To reiterate that this is our 10th uh, event, um, we always have a Ramadan event, and I'd just like to give you a back background. Those of you who already know Cage Prisoners, uh, we have been around for this length of time and have progressed and have really tried to keep to our principles. Many people ask us what was the need for Cage Prisoners there. You had Amnesty International, you had Human Rights Watch. The thing that we've always said is that uh, essentially there are some prisoners that are worthy prisoners in inverted commoners and those who are not. And until we took up the mantle of dealing with those people in Guantanamo Bay, first of all, we were told is that the next thing is that you will be in Guantanamo Bay yourself 10 years ago. And alhamdulillah, what we want to share with you all is that don't let those people who detract and go against you and complain and say there's nothing that you can do put you off. And why we've chosen this topic today of the four imams is that we have a rich heritage in Islam in the past of, of scholars who have stood up for the truth. I was just the other day taught, looking at these issues related to Muslims who've been invited to the uh, White House iftar. And I was asking myself the question that would these four imams have been also invited to the iftars of the rulers of their time? Would they have accepted? What would their response have been? What were the people around at that time who supported them? Were there a large number or a small number? And that's not something we need to worry about, the numbers of people who support. The key is that when these challenges come, and Allah has promised us this, this this is the month of Qur'an we are reciting regularly and it tells us to reflect on the messages in there. Our lives are going to be tested. And the lives of these four righteous imams and their, their students and those who followed them have been ones of test. And we have to decide ourselves, do we want to be also part of that testing or not? And what I'd like to be doing is to be introducing four eminent speakers who from their own traditions have been able to give us presentations and give us best messages and things that we can reflect on that actually show that we don't necessarily have to emulate this person or that person. We have people amongst our own heritage. We do not detract from what others who are from different viewpoints uh, are doing. And we are always appreciative. If you've seen the work that Cage Prisoners does, we work with those who stand up for justice. And that can be anybody. And the Islamic message has always been one that those who stand up for justice, then we will always be with them. And this is clearly for, from us, that whether it is for or against us, that is part of our deen. And the first person I'll be introducing up onto the stage will be Hajj Abdusamad Clark. I know him very well. I'm not sure how many of you know him, but uh, if you know from the community in Norwich. MashaAllah, it's a lovely community there, and I would recommend people to go. But he's the dean of the Faculty of Muslim Studies. He's the imam at the uh, Ehsan Mosque in Norwich, has translated a number of uh, classical texts from the Maliki tradition. And it's with my great pleasure that I introduce Hajj Clark to come and talk to us about the life and times of Imam Malik. Zakallah khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashrafil mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in wa sallama taslima Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um, The overall title is The Four Imams in the Face of Oppression and I wanted to speak about Imam Malik in the Face of Power to locate this within the context of the really important work of caged prisoners, their work on behalf of Muslims who are detained, imprisoned, and often tortured. This is a task I'm not sure that I'm up to. First, there's the need to look at the context and look properly at the situation of the Imams and their encounters with one political dynasty, the Abbasids or Bani al-Abbas. But it's also important 
to try and understand the age in which we live, the order under which we live, which is actually the thing that, it, that has really brought us here together, and to see what parallels there are, if any. This is a political order that is now at the service of a financial elite. And both of these groups, the politicians and the bankers, are in the process of throwing away a legal tradition that in Europe and America was gained after centuries of struggle. And they're reducing the human being to a new serfdom, to slaves, to slavehood. So let us look first at the issue with Imam Malik and his encounter with power. In 147 of the Hijra, the governor of Medina, Jafar, Ibn Suleiman, Ibn Ali al-Abbasi, a cousin of the Khalifa al-Mansur, forbade Imam Malik to narrate a hadith on the legal validity of a judgment that was pronounced, uh, of a divorce that was pronounced under coercion. Imam Malik insisted on narrating this hadith. The governor had Imam Malik arrested, stripped, shaved, lashed 70 times, mounted facing backwards on a, on a camel or a donkey, and paraded around Medina. Imam Malik was a man of considerable dignity. He was never seen without a turban. In this condition, he called out at the top of his voice, whoever knows me knows me. Whoever does not know me, then I am Malik ibn Anas, and I declare that divorce pronounced under compulsion is not valid. It's nothing. He said, it's Lysa be shy, it's nothing. The governor, to his credit, recognized Imam Malik's unconquerable spirit and told people to release him and let him go. It was after this event that Imam Malik's reputation in Medina, in, this, in the Muslim world, rose greatly. This was 147. The significance of the date is that it is just two years after the attempt of a man called Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn al-Hassan and nafs al zakiya radiallahu anhu wa rahimahullah. He and his brother attempted to declare for the caliphate from the city of Medina. It is often said that both Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa supported him in his claim. And it is also said that a, a motive that Al-Mansur had for imprisoning Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, in 146, the next year, and his death in prison in 148 was because of his involvement in this matter. Muhammad ibn Abdullah and Nafs al Zakiya is not so well known to us today, but in his time, he was a highly respected Sharif, one of the descendants of the Prophet. And during the turmoil at the end of the Khilafah of Bani Umayyah, there was an anticipation 
that one of the family of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would step forward for the Khilafah and many people thought it was this man and it is said at one point that even the Abbasids paid allegiance to him and a part of this was of course this name Muhammad ibn Abdullah which caused the anticipation that maybe this was in fact the Mahdi foretold in the Hadith Their attempt was unsuccessful, and both he and his brother Ibrahim died in the attempt. And the third brother, Idris, fled to the Maghrib, where he's regarded by the Moroccans really as the founder, the establisher of Islam there, and he is, of course, the founder of the dynasty that endures to this day. That was 145, 145, two years before Imam Malik's fitna. The next year, the governor of Medina, uh, Jafir ibn Suleiman, we mentioned, took up his appointment. You have to understand, you see, the, the, this is not a simple picture of heroes and villains. A Zahabi speaks of this man's eminence. He speaks highly of him. In the situation of the, the instability of the Dawla, he is said to have forced the people of Medina, at, on pain of death, to pledge allegiance to the Abbasids. He took the, the Bay'a himself, and he included in the Bay'a that if they broke their Bay'a, then their wives were divorced. This is the context. So it was then, in this context, that Imam Malik took his stand. Not any longer supporting the lost cause of a nafsa zakia, but supporting the principle of baya. The principle of baya, which is the fulcrum of political power in Islam. And I told you this is not a story of heroes and villains. Imam Malik instantly forgave the governor. He would not hold it against him because he was from, from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the, although Imam Malik was in no way a Shia, his love of the family of the Al al Bayt was very strong. In this case, the governor was from Bani Hashim, the wider family. Apart from this one incident, the relationship of Malik with the Khulafa of Bani al-Abbas were very respectful on both sides. Balanced, of course, by Imam Malik's utter lack of fear of the Khulafa and his recorded acts of counseling and advising them and commanding them to do the right and forbidding them to do the wrong. In their turn, the Khulafa of Bani al-Abbas paid him great honor. And in fact, it is al-Mansur, who was the Khalifa during this trial of Imam Malik, who commanded Imam Malik to compose the Muwatta, which is one of the cornerstones of the Sahih tradition. So how had this all come about? The first century of Islam had witnessed rapid increase in numbers and remember that the light of the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was so great that someone who saw him once is counted as a companion so life transforming was that experience but as Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ali al Maliki says in his book Muhammad al-Insan al-Kamil 
the tabi'in are only those who spent long periods of association with one of the companions. So in this generation after the companions, you had a s sudden surge in numbers of people coming into the deen who had not known the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and who had not spent time with the companions. And in that time, every conceivable sect arose, every kind of political dissension and disorder arose. These things happened both in the Aqidah and in the politics. The, the Muslims fell into four groups with respect to the leadership of Islam. The position of the Muslims, of the Ahlus Sunnah, is, gives preference to the most capable man. To the most capable man. The second position that caused a great deal of distress, which was to become what we call Shiism, was that it should be the best man. This is a subtle distinction. It should be the best man. And more specifically, one of the descendants of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and Sayyiduna, Sayyidatuna Fatima radiallahu anha. Nevertheless, although our position is that it's the most capable man, the man most capable of leadership, nevertheless, the Muslims of the Sunnah believe that Sayyidina Abu Bakr was the best man. He was not only the most capable, he was the best man, followed by Omar, followed by Omar, Uthman and Ali, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. The third position were, was the position of ignorant and literalist pietists. And this manifested at that time as the Khawarij, who were undoubtedly pious. But what a terrible force they were. The fourth position was that group who refused to fight other Muslims. Many of the companions, many of the tabi'in refused to get into a fight with a Muslim. And it is from these people that the later class of the ulama emerged and in later centuries the turuq, the tariqas of the people of Tasawwuf. So what is this issue about power and knowledge, the khulafa and the ulama? The job of power is ultimately to establish those aspects of the deen that are fard kifaya. You and I attend to what is fard ayn, the thing that we are individually responsible for. But there are many, many aspects of the deen that are obligatory upon us all, that have to be established by the sultan. Such as the building of mosques, appointment of imams, qadis, the establishment of free markets, a little known obligation of the Amir, market inspectors who ensure that the commerce is not only halal but it is just. The Sultan, the Amir, is responsible for the minting of coins since our, our Proper currency is a fundamental aspect of economic and social justice. For all of that, knowledge is needed. But power 
and the leader, leadership of men and women has other skills. And this is why political power and the knowledge of the ulama diverged. Jumping to our contemporary situation is a huge jump because we're looking for parallels. The order under which we live today, the democratic, so-called democratic order, is precisely the one which claimed to have removed arbitrary autocracy, rule by unelected people at their own whim. Yet paradoxically, it has been recognized by people in this society. We could mention George Orwell, but many informed people have realized that we have been and are heading into a totalitarianism worse than that which the Democrats claim to have removed. We need a, a long view to understand this. And the long view, quite arbitrarily in one way, will go back to Italy. And this is a banking family in Italy in the early Renaissance called the Medici. Usury and thus banking were utterly anathema to Christians although there had been a thriving illegal usury which had even then had involved the Pope. But still it was regarded as anathema. From that moment of this, this family, the banking family called the Medicis, and those who are interested in this history, I can recommend a very good documentary that's available on YouTube called The Medicis, The Godfathers of the Renaissance. From that moment, because of the nature of usury, you, the, the mathematicians, when they studied usury, they came across the, the mathematics of what is called exponential growth. The exponential curve is one that doesn't appear to move, then it moves slightly, and then it goes absolutely vertical. This is exponential growth, and this is the kind of mathematics that's involved in usury. Therefore, by that growth, banking has come from a totally prohibited and anathema form until it's now the inescapable pillar, not just of business life, not just of the state, but of domestic life. Since asking for more in return for a loan than is lent is intrinsically an act of injustice, and the job of government is to establish justice, then government itself has for a very long time really not been fulfilling its function. It has been serving the banking and the financial elite. I want you, and it's impossible because I've used up my time, impossible to go further, but you need to explore this. Do not see the war on terror as a political campaign. The nature of banking, the nature of banks, is that they need 
debtors. It is a way that is based on debtors. The nature of NATO, the American forces, the British forces, and all these other groups being lodged in the Muslim world is not, as I think most of you understand, is not the defeat of the Taliban or this group or that group. It's nothing to do with that. It is to transform those societies into willing consumers, willing clients of banking, people who will willingly give up real wealth for abstract debt wealth. And this has been going on in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and will happen in Syria tomorrow. This is what is actually going on. So, I w because I will, uh, I've overrun, so I'm happy to talk with anybody who's interested to pursue these themes a bit further afterwards, inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.